anyone who knows anything about the English-speaking world knows that our history was made by a great event in Great Britain is called the Evangelical Revival. We associate it with the work of John Wesley, George Whitfield. But in this country it's called the Great Awakening. You can't read an ordinary history book without reading about the Great Awakening in America or the Evangelical Revival of the 18th century in Great Britain. But why did they need such a revival? There's a temptation to an historian to paint the picture blacker to show up the bright lights that followed. But I want you to understand before the days of John Wesley, when John Wesley was a boy, when George Whitfield was a boy, conditions in the English-speaking world were utterly deplorable. Now you can often judge people by their sports. A great British historian, Trevelyan, said society was one vast casino. Gambling was the national pastime. Cockfighting was one of the popular diversions. The Dean of Wales Cathedral had a picture window put in the deanery so that the guests could watch cockfighting from dinner table. Now you know of course that over on the other side of the Atlantic they talk about Britain as John Bull. And they always have a bulldog. Why a bulldog? The bulldog had a retractable lower jaw. They used to use those dogs to bait bulls. Now you know animals are very sensitive in the nose. They have a stronger sense of smell than we have. In fact, some dogs can't see very far, but they can smell your scent a long way away. But they can be easily hurt. And so these dogs would fasten their teeth in the nose of the bull. This was bull baiting, another popular sport. Boxing was without any gloves. They boxed barehanded. But you were allowed to keep your thumb out. And if you could knock a man's eyeball out on his cheek, that was loudly applauded. These prize fighters used to pound each other to a bloody pulp. And this was tremendously popular. Drunkenness was prevalent. Now, English people tend to be beer drinkers, just as Germans do, but with the colonizing of the West Indies, rum and gin became popular, and people became outrageously intoxicated. London at that time had a population of 600,000, but one in every ten, excuse me, one in every six, owed his livelihood to drink. One house in every six in London was devoted to the sale of liquor. What did such hard drinking do to those people? Well, according to Bishop Benson of Gloucester, it made English people cruel and inhuman. Not only that, the theater was rotten. Addison, a famous writer, said one of the unaccountable things of utter lewdness of the stage and theater. Suddenly another writer called it coarse, obscene, and scandalous. In fact, the theater was so filthy that most theaters had a brothel alongside. They used the theater for titillation, and then they used the brothel for indulgence. The popular novel of the time was rotten. Jeffrey said there was never such a mass of rubbish published. Now, isn't it very interesting? The present wave of pornography in this country began some years ago. Do you remember how it began? It began when a lady, Catherine Windsor, wrote a book called Forever Amber. And this Forever Amber was an historical novel describing the life of this particular period. And of course, that sort of thing becomes popular with the ungodly. And now, there seems to be no limit to what people can publish. Not only that, but at that time, industry was inhuman. Women were used in the coal mines. A woman would wear a belt, a leather belt around her waist with an iron chain fastened at the navel, and the iron chain passed between her legs to a truck, and she crept on hands and knees, dragging trucks of coal. 
It's interesting, when Parliament finally put a stop to this, they put in horses instead. And one of the objections to getting the women out of the mines was because they'd have to make bigger mine tunnels because you need more space for horses to drag trucks than for women to drag trucks. The ships coming from Africa to the Western world were full of helpless slaves. I have seen that series called Roots. It wasn't exaggerated. Not at all. Blacks were packed like sardines, neck to ankle, ankle to neck. These people had never been off the land before. Africans were not seafaring people. They were seasick. They vomited over each other and were hosed down with salt water. That gave them ulcers. And if they couldn't make it, they were thrown overboard. The prisons were cesspools of iniquity. And one of the sports for Sunday afternoon, Saturday afternoon or Sunday afternoon was to watch hangings. Berkeley, for whom Berkeley, California's name, said morality and religion have collapsed to a degree that's been never known in a Christian country. So you could say there was decline everywhere. You say, what were the churches doing? The church had declined too. The church was corrupt. Butler, the famous apologist, refused to become Archbishop of Canterbury. He says, the church is too far gone. You'll find that godly people, the Puritans, were driven out. I remember when I went to stay at Oxford, I stayed in the Baptist manse at a place called Abington, seven miles from Oxford. Why was that Baptist church built there? Because Baptists weren't allowed to live within seven miles of a city. They were persecuted. That's why the Puritans fled the country and came to New England. There was a case where a godly bishop, the Bishop of Chester, rebuked a clergyman for drunkenness. And the surprised clergyman, he had never been told off before, he said, but sir, I never get drunk on duty. In other words, he was drunk most of the time except at Holy Communion. He always, he said, I have a, I have a conscience. I never get drunk at Holy Communion. One of the great unbelievers of the day was Lord Bolingbroke. He told the clergy in a meeting in London that the greatest miracle of Christianity was that the preaching of it was committed to such an ungodly bunch as they were. He said, well, what about the others? What about the Baptists and the Congregationalists and the others? They'd lost their power. And the same thing was happening in Scotland. And the same thing was happening in Wales. But what about those godly Puritans that ran away from all this and settled in New England and other parts of the American colonies? Now oh, the tide had gone out there too. Now you may not know that when the New England Commonwealth was set up, you had to be converted to be a member of a church. And you had to be a member of a church to vote in the election. You couldn't vote unless you were a church member, and you couldn't be a church member unless you were converted. That meant that about a tenth of the voting population voted. The others paid taxes and they didn't like it. So they grumbled. Americans always have hated this idea of taxation without representation. So they grumbled. And finally, the Puritans, instead of separating church and state, as Roger Williams suggested, the Puritans worked out a compromise. They said if any man had a father or mother or grandparents who were church members, he could be an associate member and vote. And that let the world into the church. Now you know, for instance, supposing this church was identified with this community in the valley, and supposing the issue came up whether or not we should have drinking and dancing on church premises. Most of the church people say certainly not. But when the issue would come up, 
and judging from those New England days, they'd call a town meeting. If it were left to the people of the San Fernando Valley to decide whether or not you had drinking and dancing the property, they wouldn't vote as you vote. So the world came into the church. Now remember, the church should be in the world just as a ship should be in the ocean. But the ocean should not be in the ship and the world should not be in the church. You've heard perhaps of great American Puritan Dr. Increase Mather and he published a, a sermon called The Glory Departed. He said, we're the posterity of the good old Puritans who were a strict and holy people. Such were our fathers who followed the Lord into this wilderness. He said, you that are aged can remember what in New England was like 50 years ago when the churches were in their first glory. Time there was when many were converted and there were added to the church daily such as should be saved. But are not sound conversions rare this day? Cotton Mather said there's been a horrible decay. Now you may say, why did the Puritans lose their spirituality? Well, this was a rough country. They were settling a wilderness. Brutalizing contacts with primitive Red Indians and with African slaves, lack of enforcement of the law, increase of wicked vices and brutal pleasures, gambling, cockfighting, horse racing, prize fighting, and all the rest. Profanity and drunkenness demoralized the American colonists. It seemed as if the whole of the English-speaking world was corrupt. Now don't forget, at that time, the population of Great Britain was much greater than the American colonies. You know, when these colonies became independent, there were only five million people here. Only five million. At the time I'm speaking about, much fewer in number then. But the revival began about the year 1727. Almost simultaneously, in New Jersey, and in Hernhut in Germany among the Moravians. I won't weary you now with the details about the Moravians. They were the ones who developed such a missionary conscience. But there was in America a Dutchman called Theodore Frelinghuysen. He had been soundly converted and became a pietist. He preached a pure religion. When he was appointed to the Dutch Reformed Church in New Brunswick, New Jersey, near Princeton, he found the church full of ungodly people. Anyone who spoke Dutch could be a member of the church. So he adopted what we call Eucharistic Evangelism. You say, now I haven't heard of that before. Every three months, all these people got together for Holy Communion. It's the same among Presbyterians. And they would have one or two preparatory services before they partook of the bread and wine. They'd come in in their wagons. Conditions were very primitive. But he began preaching evangelism before communion. He preached on whoever eats and drinks unworthily, eats and drinks damnation to his own soul. Now some sinners began to tremble and some got very angry. In fact, they appealed to the governor of New Jersey they appealed to the classes of New York. They appealed to Amsterdam to have him removed. The old people resented this. They said that the former minister didn't keep us away from the Lord's table. He said, I'm not keeping you away. I'm telling you, you've got to live right to come to the Lord's table. But the young people responded. And that was the beginning of the revival there. Now, the same revival, of course, affected England. I must condense what I say about conditions across the Atlantic. You know that John Wesley, a very godly young man, went to be a chaplain in Georgia in the colony at Savannah. But um, he fell in love with a girl there. He couldn't bring himself to propose. He was a very introspective sort of fellow. 
the girl waited patiently to see what he was going to do, and then on the rebound she married somebody else. What did John Wesley do? He refused to let this girl and her husband come to communion. He was asked why. He said, because she's a hypocrite. What do you mean she's a hypocrite? Well, she loves me and she married him. <laughs> the husband had a warrant sworn out for his arrest. And John Wesley decided that discretion was the better part of valor. He got on a horse and didn't stop galloping until he reached Philadelphia. Then he took ship for England. You might call that prevenient grace. He was a great horseman after that. When John Wesley got back to England, he met George Whitfield. And he said, I'm thinking of going to America. And John Wesley said, don't go. It's hopeless there. But they drew lots, and George Whitfield decided to come. Now, in England, John Wesley, when he was a student, belonged to a little club. They were called the Bible Moths. The nickname that stuck most was the Methodists. They went to communion every day. They visited the sick. They fasted. They had a method of living. It was all works, works, works. But they meant them. And uh, that's where the name Methodist came from. It was a nickname. But the first to be converted in that group was George Whitfield. He worked so hard at it, he got ill. And while he was in bed, he read a book called The Life of God and the Soul of Man by a man called Henry Scougal. And this book upset him. Scougal said, religion is not a lot of duties and exercises. It's the life of God in your soul, union with God. And as a result of that, George Whitfield was converted. After Wesley came back from America, he was very unhappy. He had met a Moravian missionary on the ship. And he said, I, he told the missionary, I just don't have the faith. And Peter Buller said something to him that was very strange. He said, preach faith until you have it. In other words, don't give up the ministry, but preach it until you get it yourself. Now, one night, John Wesley went to St. Paul's Cathedral, that lovely cathedral in London. And the choir sang a magnificent number. He went to a prayer meeting at Aldersgate Street afterwards. And someone was reading from Luther's introduction to the epistle to the Romans. And suddenly it dawned on John Wesley that sins were forgiven. Now it's strange today, when something like that dawns on our soul, we show it in certain ways, don't we? They fell to their knees and sang, We praise thee, O God, we acknowledge thee to be the Lord. Those old-fashioned words. And from that time on, John Wesley became a powerful preacher of the gospel. Now, George Whitfield started preaching in Bristol, the second largest city of England at that time. But he had to move off to somewhere else. So he asked John Wesley, would you take my place? The churches were closed to them. They were preaching in the open air. John Wesley said in his diary, I thought it was a sin to preach in the open air. He believed as a clergyman you ought to preach in a consecrated building, a parish church. He said, I could scarce reconcile myself at first to this strange way of preaching in the fields, of which he set me an example on Sunday. I should have thought the saving of souls almost a sin if it had not been done in church. But he tried it. 24 hours later, John Wesley preached in the open air. And in his diary, he said, I made a bright succession of appeals to the reason, the conscience, and the heart of my hearers. Now, I used to think John Wesley must have been a genius of an evangelist, that strong men were broken down and wept. Not at all. He was a very stuffy high churchman. But the point was this, the Holy Spirit at that time 
was poured out upon believers to revive the church. And at the same time, the Holy Spirit was poured out upon the people to awaken the masses. The result was these miners who had come out to gamble and to fight and to misbehave in every possible way were deeply convicted of sin and began to repent and be converted. So John Wesley formed a society. See, the churches wouldn't open their doors to him, but formed a little society that met, quote, to confess their faults one to another and pray for one another that they may be healed. That was the first Methodist class meeting, and out of that came the whole Methodist denomination. Now, in 1739, by the way, John Wesley was converted in 1738. George Whitfield began his London ministry. The only church in London that was willing to have him was that great St. Mary's Church in Islington, in North London. But the vicar was overridden over by the church wardens. They locked the doors against Whitfield. The result was he preached in the churchyard. And then he began preaching in the open airs. And he used to have 10,000, 20,000. Oh, I would have loved to have heard George Whitfield preach. In those days, there was no amplification, no loudspeakers. Do you know that when Whitfield was crossing the Atlantic on those little sailing ships, they would form like a V of ducks for a convoy, for protection against the wind to help each other if a storm came up. And it was a calm Sunday, because it took a month or more to come across. If it was a calm Sunday, Whitfield would conduct divine worship for the fleet. He had such a voice, he could lead worship from the leading ship to the whole ship and the, all the ships present. When he preached in Philadelphia at the Custom House Steps, crowds used to gather across the river in New Jersey to listen to him. Benjamin Franklin was no fool. He was a mathematician. He calculated by pi r squared and all the rest of it that the total number listening to Whitfield's unaided voice was 25,000. His enemy said he could reduce an audience to tears by the way he pronounced the word Mesopotamia. <laughs> now when he came, there had been glimmerings of revival in the American colonies already. Revival began 1727 in New Jersey under Frelinghausen. It spread from the Dutch Reform to the Scotch-Irish Presbyterians. Now, most Americans misunderstand the word Scotch-Irish. They think, well, that means his mother was Scotch and his father was Irish. No, no, the Scotch-Irish are the north of Ireland people, largely Presbyterian, very rugged lot. I remember reading in the history of the Allegheny Presbytery the prayer of a Scotch-Irish Presbyterian elder in the Kirk session. He prayed, Grant, O Lord, that I may always be right, for thou knowest, Lord, that I am hard to turn. <laughs> I thought that was a very good Presbyterian prayer. <laughs> now, the revival spread from the Dutch Reformed through a man called Gilbert Tennant to the Scotch-Irish Presbyterians, who spoke English with a Scotch-Irish accent. They had so many candidates for the ministry, they started a little log college just north of Philadelphia, a place called Neshimony. That log college, Whitfield visited and described for us. And he said that from it were going forth many faithful servants of Jesus. Just a rough log college. That college grew and grew until today it's known as Princeton University. Do you know that most of American universities, the old ones, came out of that revival? I won't go into all the details, but most of them came out of that revival. It spread from the Scotch-Irish Presbyterians to the Baptists. Before the Great Awakening, there weren't more than 500 Baptists in the colonies. Now they've got 21 million. You can trace them right back to that revival. Then it jumped north and broke out in North Massachusetts under Jonathan Edwards in that great revival of 1738. And then it began to spread, and then who should arrive but George Whitfield. 
George Whitfield's on a sailing ship headed for Philadelphia, but it landed in North Carolina. They weren't very exact in those days. He meant to get to Philadelphia, so he had to go the rest of the way by horse. But when he started preaching, he had phenomenal response. Benjamin Franklin said his preaching was the most powerful he'd ever heard. Benjamin Franklin once was talking to George Whitfield. Whitfield said, I'm going to start an orphanage in Savannah. Franklin said, you're crazy. Not Savannah, way down there. Philadelphia is the center of all the colonies. Now you build it here and I'll help you financially. Whitfield said, God has spoken to me and I'm going to start it in Savannah. So Benjamin Franklin said he's not going to get any money from me. Now he went to one of these meetings and he saw that George Whitfield was going to take up a collection for his orphanage. He said in his pocket he had a five dollar gold piece, some silver dollars, and some copper. But he determined not to give anything, he didn't approve. But when the plate was passed, he relented and decided to put in the copper. George Whitfield was preaching so powerfully, he decided, well, I'll give him the silver as well. And finally, he put in gold, silver, and copper, and everything. He said that man could really preach. Now, what was the result of this awakening? It completely turned the colonies around from being a rough frontier society to being a godly nation again. And what was its effect in England? It was the great event of that century. It turned the English-speaking people towards God. Now, some people say, well, why do we have to talk about these things that happened such a long time ago? It's very simple. The scripture tells us to tell our children and our children's children what God has done. Why? That they might not forget his commandments. They might put their trust in God. He will answer in due course. You'll find many, many times revival has broken out among God's people when they heard of what God has done and what God can do. Now that's only part of my message. During the bicentennial year, I heard a friend of mine on television say it's about time people realize that this republic was founded by men of God and men of prayer. I said to my wife, that's only half true. There were men of God and men of prayer in the revolution. There were some who were not. Who could call Tom Paine a man of God? He died in disgrace. On the other hand, Thomas Jefferson was a great man. But he didn't believe in the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. When he wrote the Declaration of Independence, he didn't mention God. And the religious people ganged up on him and said, you must mention God. So he worked it in. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. They're endowed by their creator with certain rights. And he spoke of nature's God. But one of the heroes of the Revolutionary War was General Charles Lee. And he said, let's tear down all the churches. They stand in the way of progress. On the other hand, uh, they say that George Washington was a man of prayer. I understand his prayer life reached a climax at Valley Forge. He needed to pray there, all right. <laughs> there were evangelicals and there were free thinkers working together for the independence of this country. But what most people don't know is that in the wake of the Revolutionary War, there was a moral slump unparalleled. Drunkenness was epidemic. Out of a population of five million, 300,000 were confirmed drunkards. They were burying 15,000 of them a year. They even had a whiskey rebellion. Just as Abby Hoffman said not so long ago, every American has a right to grow his own marijuana in his backyard. These men said every American has a right to distill his own whiskey and they wouldn't pay revenue. And George Washington had to call out the National Guard of four states to put down the armed rebellion to overthrow the government of the country. Profanity was of the most shocking kind. Immorality was rampant with venereal disease and illegitimacy and the like. Women were afraid to go out for fear of assault. 
Bank robberies had become an altogether daily occurrence. What about the colleges, the hope of the nation, the young leaders of the future? They took a poll at Harvard and discovered not one believer in the whole student body. At Princeton, a much more evangelical place, they also took a poll and discovered only two believers and only five that didn't belong to the filthy speech movement of that day. What were the churches doing? The largest denomination was the Congregational. Take a typical example, the Reverend Samuel Shepherd of Lenox in Massachusetts announced that he hadn't taken a single young person into fellowship in 16 years. He said prospects were altogether melancholy. It was as if he was chaplain to an old people's home dying off. The Presbyterians met in General Assembly and their main topic was to discuss the gross immorality of the country. The most aggressive were the Methodists and they were losing 4,000 members a year. The Baptists said that had their worst winter. The Lutherans were so languishing they discussed amalgamating with the Episcopalians who were even worse off. They thought they would prop each other up. Samuel Provost, Bishop of New York, quit functioning. He had confirmed no one for so long he decided he was out of work. John Marshall was Chief Justice of the United States and he wrote to the Bishop of Virginia, Bishop Madison. He said, the church is too far gone ever to be redeemed. Voltaire said, in 30 years time, Christianity will be forgotten. We went through a siege in this country in the 1970s, 60s and 70s, but nobody suggested the church was going to be wiped out. But in those days, the churches were in deadly fear. The young people had been turned away, and the churches were dying off. This may sound like the hysteria of the moment, but Kenneth Scott Lantourette, the great church historian, said, it seemed as if Christianity were about to be ushered out of the affairs of men. Why? In the American Union of States, Possibly the result of the war, in wartime, especially war fought on your own territory, there's always a moral slump. But then came the French Revolution, and the French Revolution was anti-Christian. They crowned a prostitute goddess of reason in Notre Dame Cathedral. Practically every church in France was closed, and the French were subscribing millions of dollars to enlighten young Americans. Now, how did this state of affairs come to be changed? It came through a movement of prayer. I must backtrack a little bit. A group of Scottish ministers published a plea for prayer for revival. A copy was sent to Jonathan Edwards, the great American theologian. Jonathan Edwards had seen the revival of 1734 in Massachusetts, and then he had seen the great movement I spoke about under Whitfield in 1740. This warmed his heart. He was so moved he wrote a response. His response got longer than a letter, became a book. The title of the book, if my memory serves me correctly, was as follows. A humble attempt to promote explicit agreement and visible union of all God's people in extraordinary prayer for the revival of religion and the extension of Christ's kingdom according to scriptural promise and prophecies concerning the last time. <laughs> that was the title, not the book itself. Nowadays, titles are scarcely related to content. If you want to study the weather, meteorology, you do not read Gone with the Wind. It has nothing to do with that. But in those days, the title told you what was in the book. Now, in case you missed the force of it, a humble attempt, that was New England modesty, to promote explicit agreement and visible union of all God's people in extraordinary prayer. That's what's so often missing from our ventures. Some of you may remember Key 73, 
when they had a great evangelistic drive all over the United States. But they took the attitude, you Southern Baptists don't need to work with the Missouri Lutherans. Do your own thing, but do it at the same time. You Pentecostals and you Presbyterians don't work together. Just do your own thing and perhaps we shall secure a great awakening. There wasn't an explicit agreement and visible union in extraordinary prayer. You may say, well, what do you mean by extraordinary prayer? Well, what is ordinary prayer? Do you pray before you eat? That's ordinary prayer. Do you pray in church? That's ordinary prayer. But when people pray all night, or get up at six in the morning to pray, or give up the lunchtime to pray, that is extraordinary prayer. And that's what Jonathan Edwards pleaded for. After he died, a Scottish minister called John Erskine published the two books, the Scottish one and the American one together. He sent a copy to Mr. Baptist, Dr. John Ryland, editor of the Baptist Register in Bristol, in England. John Ryland didn't want to throw away a book on prayer, so he sent with two copies, one to Andrew Fuller and the other to John Sutcliffe. They were men of prayer. Fuller took leave of absence and traveled the length and breadth of Britain, urging the Baptists to set aside one day a month to pray for revival. Sutcliffe, for domestic reasons, didn't travel, but he had a very lively layman in his congregation called William Carey, afterwards the great missionary. And between them, they started what they called the Union of Prayer. They got every church to set aside one day a month to pray for a spiritual awakening. Then the Congregationalists joined them. Then the Methodist societies. And then Evangelicals of the Church of England and the Church of Scotland until Britain was interlaced with a network of prayer meetings. This was seven years before the French Revolution. John Wesley, still preaching in his 80s, died in 1791. And the revival began in 1792. It started in Yorkshire in the industrial heart of Britain. And it started in prayer meetings. Not so much in preaching services, but in prayer meetings. However, I want, don't want to weary you with details about the British aspect of the revival, but I've told you of the terrible conditions in this country at that time. The first sign of the coming movement was 1792 in Boston, where First Baptist Church had a series of meetings in the midst of a very cold winter, amidst blizzards and the like. So many converts were added to First and Second Baptist Churches. Now you know, of course, Boston at that time was a congregational city. But the Congregationalists had been turning to Unitarianism. In fact, only one Congregational Church in the whole of Boston remained untouched, and that was the Old South Church. But this little touch of revival did something to encourage people. Then about 1794, Isaac Bacchus, a godly New England minister, sent out a letter addressed to every Christian denomination in the United States, saying that they ought to set aside time to pray because their back was to the wall. It was well received. The Presbyterian synods of New Jersey and Pennsylvania adopted it. Bishop Asbury adopted it for the Methodists. The Baptist associations, the Congregational associations, all the other denominations, one after the other, adopted this until the United States was interlaced with a network of prayer meetings, praying that God would intervene in national affairs. The revival began towards 1796, by 1798, it was general. Churches crowded out. Now, the young people had been alienated from the churches, but so great was the power of God that young people would be convicted of sin on the dance floor, in the tavern, and then leave and go and seek spiritual counsel. This happened all over New England. And by the way, I notice in every report it says, without extravagant outcry or ranting. Uh, there was a reason for that. In the wake of the former revival, there was a man called Davenport who simply tried to exploit all the emotionalism of the previous revival. And so these ministers were careful to say it was a deep 
solemn work of grace without any extravagance of feeling. I told you that in Lenox, Massachusetts, the pastor hadn't taken anyone in to membership for 16 years, but he said the showers of blessing began to fall, and then they took in five times as many people as any previous year in the history of the church. The revival spread to New York and Philadelphia, and then the smaller towns. The western parts of New York, among the settlers, had the most startling displays of excitement. Now, the population of the United States was largely east of the Alleghenies at that time, three quarters of the population. And this was a deep, deep movement. Some pastors in New Jersey hit on the idea of having Aaron and her societies. That's a novel idea. You remember the story of Moses praying and while he held up his hands, Israel prevailed over Amalek. But when his arms got tired, then Aaron and her came and propped up his arms. These pastors got the praying people of the congregation to pray for them while they preached. The result was multitudes of conversions. I forgot to mention to you that the worst conditions in the United States at that time were in Kentucky and Tennessee. A committee of Congress discovered that there hadn't been more than one court of justice held in five years in Kentucky. The decent people formed vigilante regiments and fought the outlaws in a pitched battle and lost. So that Kentucky and Tennessee were like Sodom and Gomorrah to the Christians. Peter Cartwright, the Methodist evangelist, said that when his father settled in Logan County, Kentucky, it was known as Rogue's Harbor. If anyone committed a murder in Massachusetts or a robbery in Rhode Island, all he needed to do was get across the mountains, nobody could lay a finger on him. Now there was a Scotch-Irish Presbyterian minister called James McGrady, whose chief claim to fame seemed to be that he was so ugly he attracted attention. <laughs> he would stop in the street and say, did you see that face? What does he do? They say, he's a preacher. Then they reacted, they said, a man with a handicap like that really must have something to say. <laughs> so they'd come to hear him preach. They said his voice was tremulous, his gestures were coarse, and uh, it was altogether unprepossessing. He followed the immigrants over the Cumberland Gap into Kentucky and settled in Rogue's Harbor. He had three little box-like Presbyterian churches. He said the winter of 1799, for the most part, was weeping and mourning with the people of God. But he was such a man of prayer, he not only promoted the concert of prayer one day a month that all the churches were doing, but he asked his people, will you pray for me when the sun sets on Saturday for half an hour, and when the sun rises on Sunday for half an hour? It was heartbreaking work, but in 1800 there came a deluge of blessing. 17,000 people showed up for a communion service. Lots of them were not converted, so they had preaching before that. Then they had meetings as large as 25,000. This was the beginning of the great camp meeting movement. I said that in the eastern parts of the states there were no extravagances, but in the western parts there were. There were people, for instance, who would scream under conviction, some who would faint, some who would tremble, some who trembled so much they jerked. I read about all these things, but one thing I couldn't understand was the reports that I'd heard of barking. Now, I have seen people who trembled. I saw a schoolboy tremble when he thought he was going to be expelled. I saw a soldier faint when he thought he was going to be shot in a court-martial. As far as Dancing for Joy is concerned, just look at the giveaway programs on TV and you'll see people dancing for joy. These things you can understand, but why should anyone bark? <laughs> I decided to try and research this. I read a book by F.M. Davenport which said it was called Primitive Traits in Religious Revivals. It said there was barking on the frontier but it was not too common. I looked for a footnote to see where he got this. He didn't have any footnote, didn't say where it happened. Then 40 years later, Professor Alice Tyler, a University of Minnesota, wrote a book called Freedom's Ferment, in which he said there was barking on the frontier and it was altogether too common. 
I looked for a footnote. It cited Davenport, but he didn't say that. <laughs> then a Catholic writer, Francis Xavier Curran, wrote a book, I've forgotten the title, in which he said there was barking on the frontier and it was disgraceful. I looked for footnotes, Davenport and Tyler. <laughs> So I thought, well, let's go back, that's what an historian does, go back to books written at the time to see what they said then. I got David Benedict's History of the Baptists, a huge tome. He knew how many Baptists there were in Islington and London, how many Baptists there were in Hogs Hollow in Tennessee. He wrote to them all, got all their statistics and wrote this great encyclopedia of Baptists. So I could hardly wait to turn to the revival in Kentucky, 1800. And there it said, the Baptists did not bark. <laughs> but, but it said, the Presbyterians did. <laughs> then I got the writings of Barton Stone, one of the founders of the Disciples of Christ. He was there. He said there was no barking. There were some people, you know, you know, like a child sobbing, <laughs> sobbing like this, grunting while they sobbed. He said that was the nearest thing to barking. But you see, American humor is always exaggeration. British humor is always understatement. But in America, we always tell tall stories. And this story is tall, told all over the United States in our seminaries that that's the way Christians carry on. I raised this matter at the Conference of Faith and History to 300 historians at Capital University in Ohio. They fell on me like a ton of bricks. They said, oh, you're spoiling good fun. <laughs> but it simply was not true. Now this revival spread from Kentucky and Tennessee to the Carolinas, into Georgia. It swept the whole of the United States. You say, well, what good did it do? It did untold good. Now, of course, this was a country being settled in those days. At that time, Great Britain was the industrial workshop of the world. And they had problems we were to face later. But it was out of this revival that came the abolition of the slave trade. William Wilberforce went into Parliament to stand for God and righteousness. The result was the abolition of the slave trade. Slave trade. You have uh, read or seen that film, Roots. It's not exaggerated. The conditions on the slave ships were so terrible that 50% of the slaves never reached the plantations. And it was interesting that while Britain was fighting Napoleon, they passed this law. And then they used the Royal Navy, which was the strongest military force on earth at the end of that war, to hunt down the slave traders on the high seas. Actually, the number of deaths went up for a while. You might say, why? If a Portuguese slave trader running from Angola to Brazil saw a British warship on the horizon in those days of sail, they said it'll be five hours before they overtake us, clean the decks, and they threw them overboard to the sharks. So the death rate went up for a while. But at the end of the war, Britain made treaties with each country, including the United States. No more slave trading. That came out of the revival. Most Americans don't think much of George III, but I was interested to notice that Prince Charles on television the other day said we regard him as a good king. He blundered in his American policy, but he was very good in England. He heard that a single teacher was teaching a school of 800 boys. I wonder if there's a Sunday school teacher here who has eight boys. What's your problem? They've got a very short attention span, to say the least. You have to control them. The king thought, how could one teacher run a school of 800 boys? He got his coach, and coachmen went down to visit the school on Borough Road in London. Joseph Lancaster was a man, he was a Quaker, and this was in the revival. The king said, my good man, how do you maintain order? And Lancaster said, by the same principle, thy majesty's army is kept in order by the chain of command. What he had done was to take a dozen boys off the streets. At that time, people were working a 16-hour day. There was no time for their children. The children were little vandals running the streets wild. He said to the boys, I'll teach you to read and write. 
I said, what good would it do us? He said, then you'll get a job, and he persuaded a dozen. After teaching them for a year, he said, now, if I teach you next year, second year, would you teach first year? And then when they got to third year, he taught third year, they taught second year, and second year taught first year. You say, would that work? Just take a 14-year-old boy and put him in charge of some Cub Scouts 10 years of age. Will he exercise authority? Of course he will. <laughs> and that was the beginning of what they called monitorial education. Out of it came popular education. Up to that time, education was only for the wealthy and the privileged. That came out of the revival. Out of that came the abolition of the use of women in coal mines to drag the coal like beasts of burden. Out of that came so many things. For instance, a little Welsh girl during the revival walked 30 miles in her bare feet to try and buy a Bible. She got there, they're all sold. She returned in tears. Thomas Charles, one of the leaders of the revival in Wales, was so concerned he took his carriage and went up to London to beg people to print Bibles. Nobody seemed willing to do it, so he formed his own committee, and it was called the British and Foreign Bible Society, the first of the Bible societies. That came out of the revival. You remember I said that in the colleges conditions were bad? At Williams College in Massachusetts that had a mock commune to make fun of Jesus Christ. Christians were so few on campus in those revolutionary days that they kept their minutes in code and met in secret like a communist cell. A group of them who were revived met under a haystack sheltering from the rain and promised God they'd go anywhere in the world he would send them. You say, well that happens at Forest Home, that happens at lots of camps. In those days there were no missionary societies to take them. These young men finished their studies and then went down to Boston to the headquarters of their denomination and asked to be sent overseas as missionaries. Someone said, uh, who do they think they are? Another man said, we don't have money to do it. One man said, if God has spoken to these young men, I think we should help them. So they formed a committee called the American Board of Commissioners for Foreign Missions. That was the first American missionary society. The first missionary they sent out was Adoniram Judson. He went to India, then to Burma. On his way to Calcutta, he became convinced of Baptist principles and asked William Carey to baptize him in Calcutta. Rather embarrassing to go out as a congregational missionary and become a Baptist on the field. So he sent some of his friends back to raise money and out of that came the American Baptist Foreign Mission Society. One denomination after another, all the missionary societies of the denominations came out of that revival. There were so many other things that were done that all you could say was the place had been completely transformed. George Baxter from Philadelphia went up to Kentucky, that place which had been so wicked in its ways, and he said, I have never come across such a moral community in all my life. The whole of the young United States was changed. Young people were converted on the frontier, went back to these colleges where they were having religious revivals right along, and there they trained for the ministry, went out as missionaries or became pastors of home churches. And the young United States became a comparatively Christian country. Most important, its leading edge, the frontier, was Christianized as it moved west. In 1860, of 180 colleges in the, in the Middle West, 144 had been started by evangelists and revivalists. It all came out of that revival. Now some people may say, how long did the revival of 1792 continue? Some say for 50 years, unbroken revival. Sometimes, of course, the tide goes out, then has to come in again. But in this case, 1830, there came another revival that strengthened the work. But that's another story. All I'm trying to tell you is this. The Great Awakening of 1792 came about because in Britain they formed a union of prayer and because in America they formed what they called the Concert of Prayer.
prayer is the least of what we can do to bring about a spiritual awakening in our time. May God grant it.